Anyway, we're so happy to have Frank here. Somebody came up to me last night and said, how in the world did you get Frank Turek to come to your church? He is huge. He's not that big, really. But he's huge. I said, you know what we did? We, uh, we called him and invited him to come. And he said, okay, <laughs> okay. And here, I mean, that, that is a great honor to have somebody, someone of Frank's caliber come to Bedford to our church, one of the top Christian apologists in the entire world. So let's make him welcome to our church from, Bed from North Carolina, <laughs> Dr. Frank. Thanks, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the reason I'm here is because Ken said we're having pizza and ice cream. Aren't we having that? Yeah. They're not going to show up if we don't have pizza and ice cream, ice man. Cream, ice cream. Let's get on with it. Now, how many people were here last night or were somewhere else at the time? <laughs> All right, good. Well, for those of you that were not here last night, we started talking about I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And let me start out by saying that a couple of years ago, I got an email from a United States Marine. So I knew this man was no sissy. I was actually in the Navy for eight years, which by the way stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> but this guy was in the Marine Corps. He wasn't writing me as a tough guy, however. He was writing me as a distraught father. He said, my daughter was the top Christian student in her high school class. She helped lead the youth group at church. She won several scholarships from Christian organizations to go to college. She could take them to any college she wanted to. So she took them to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to win the campus for Christ. And it needs to be one for Christ. He said, we sent her off there. About four weeks into her first semester, I got a phone call from her. Her words devastated me. She said, Dad, I don't believe in God anymore. Don't believe in God anymore? What? He said, I got in my car. I drove four hours down to Chapel Hill. I sat down with her that week, and I got nowhere with her. What do you mean you don't believe in God anymore? What happened? And she said, well, we have an atheist who teaches the New Testament class here at Chapel Hill. And he said, we don't even know who wrote the Gospels, and the Bible has errors in it, so Dad, I'm an atheist now. Yeah. Now, it just so happens this Thursday night, I'm going to Chapel Hill to do this presentation, so pray it goes well. Whenever you call something, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, you always get no signal. You always get a lot of atheists showing up because whenever you call it, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, they, uh, stand by for Victor, Victor. They, um, there it is. They want to come ask questions. And so there'll be plenty of questions. But this guy said, well, why? Why would she do this? Let me ask you a question. Do you think that in four weeks, this young woman investigated all the evidence for and against Christianity and made a rational decision it was false. There's no way to do that in four weeks. There were other things going on, but I can tell you one thing that was for sure. She didn't have any evidence that was true because she'd never been given the evidence. She was just told, hey, just believe this. And by the way, do you think this woman was typical or atypical of young people that go to college? <laughs> typical. About 75% walk away from the church once they leave the home. One of the reasons they do this, in fact, the top reason they do this is intellectually they don't know why Christianity is true because we've never told them why it's true. But, you know, it's actually all not that, it's not that difficult to show people why Christianity is true. As I mentioned last night, you only need to answer four questions in the affirmative to show that Christianity is true. In other words, if you ask these four questions and get evidence to answer these four questions yes, then you can show beyond any reasonable doubt that Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. is some pretty grooving music, as I mentioned last night, isn't it? That's from the TV show that I said is on Wednesday nights on DirecTV Channel 378. 
We got people with DirecTV in here? Okay, if you don't have DirecTV, that's okay. You can watch it on Roku or our website, crossexamine.org. We also spend an hour each week on the radio, a bunch of stations around the country. But if it's not in the local area, it is on the internet. It's podcasted. It's on our new app, which I'll tell you more about later. So what we do on that show is we present evidence for Christianity. We cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why again are these the four questions? This will be review for those of you who were here last night, but this is kind of the overview of what we're doing here last night and today, this afternoon and tonight. We're going to cover these four questions in order. The first question is, does truth exist? And the reason you got to deal with that question is because if there is no truth or all truth is relative, then quite obviously the Bible can't be true. Of course, if there is no truth, then any book written by an atheist can't be true either, right? Now, last night we covered this, right? If someone were to ever say to you, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Is that true? Is, that true? is it true that there is no truth? Because if it's true that there is no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true, right? <laughs> this is known as a self-defeating statement. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English, right? If someone would ever say that, you'd go, hey, you just used English to say that. That's self-defeating. Or it's like saying my brother is an only child. Or my parents had no kids that lived, right? These are all self-defeating statements. And relativism, also sometimes called postmodernism, is self-defeating. It says there is no truth while claiming it's true that there is no truth. And we mentioned last night that if you get good at identifying self-defeating statements, you're going to be really good as an apologist. Now, second question, does God exist? You can't have a word from God if there's no God, right? If there is no God, you can throw the Bible away and every other book that talks about God. But I hope to show you here this morning, there really is a theistic God. What's a theistic God? A spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who sustains the universe and sustains you. We're going to look at that evidence here this morning. Third question is, are miracles possible? Obviously, the Bible can't be true if miracles are not possible. But I hope to show you today that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred. And we have scientific evidence for it. Yeah. Then and only then can we get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, God exists, and miracles are possible then we can see if we have an accurate, historically reliable account of miracles occurring in the first century to a man named Jesus and his apostles in the 27 handwritten Greek manuscripts we put under one binding we now call the New Testament. Do these documents tell us the truth, or were they written down much later by religious zealots who embellished it and made it up? Because as Ken mentioned last night, you can't trust religious people, right, Ken? That's right. All right? They're untrustworthy. That's, right. that's, that's what people say anyway. Is that true? People are going, we're religious people, Frank. What are you talking about? We'll get there, okay? We're going to talk about that tonight. Now, some of you are going, what about the Old Testament? You believe the Old Testament's true? Well, if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Why? Who's in the New Testament that could authenticate the Old Testament? Jesus, right? If Jesus really is God, as the New Testament documents claim he is, now that's a big if, but if he really is God, whatever God teaches is true, Jesus taught the entire Old Testament is the word of God, so if the New Testament's reliable, you get the Old Testament thrown in. Now, the book goes into a lot more detail than what I'm talking about here. There's actually 12 points that show that Christianity is true, but these are the main four. But the overall argument is truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. If the New Testament's reliable, Christianity is true. Now, if you want to go further in this, the books are available on the book table. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. There's a 12-part DVD set out there. And Ken made an offer to you. He said, if you give us $1,500, I'll give you two DVDs. If you give us $1,500, I'll give you my car. Okay, so. <laughs> no, this, uh, this DVD set will go into a lot more detail than what we can do here. It's a 12 parts, 30 to 45 minutes apart. It has workbooks you can get, curriculum you can get. And then the new book is called Stealing from God, which is not about what, Susan? It's not about tithing. Thanks, Pastor. It's not about this. Is this book about tithing? No. The book is called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And when atheists try and make the case that atheism is true, they're stealing aspects of God's universe to say he doesn't exist. Atheists wouldn't be able to make any case unless there was a God. 
And that's what the book points out, okay? Now, if you just want to get the PowerPoint for all this, you can do this. Crossexamine.org forward slash CP. Go to our website, type in forward slash CP, which stands for college prep. We're on college campuses a lot. And if you send me your email address, I'm going to send you this PowerPoint presentation in a PDF form. So you, you, don't, you, know, you can have all this. I'm going to go through it very quickly. You won't be able to keep up. And uh, it has more in here than what I can even say. Okay. Now, by the way, I want to point out also that all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine. Okay. <laughs> Just so you know. I've got three sons, so I need some help. In fact, actually, they're all grown now. As I mentioned, I was in the Navy, but uh, two of my sons were interested in getting in the military when they were like, about to graduate high school. They said, Dad, we want to go in the military. What should we do? I said, look, if you want to fight, go Navy. Because wherever there, there's a problem, we bring our airport right there and we handle it. But if you want a nice life, go Air Force, right? So they went Air Force. The oldest one's an intelligence officer. He just got back from a year in Qatar. The second one is a KC-10 pilot. He's out in uh, California, but he goes over the Middle East quite a lot. And a KC-10, if you don't know, it's like a DC-10, but also does is refuels other planes. It's a refueler. So what we say around the house is Spencer, all he does all day is he goes up to 30,000 feet and he passes gas. <laughs> That's what he does. It's not a bad gig, right? <laughs> All right, so last night we covered Does Truth Exist? And we pointed out, just point out that it's self-defeating to say there is no truth. It's self-defeating to say all truth is relative. It's self-defeating to say there are no absolutes. It's self-defeating to say you ought not judge, right? Because it's a judgment. So don't buy into any of that. What we're going to talk about here in this morning session is Does God Exist? And then if we have time, we'll, uh, well, if I time this just right, we'll have no time for questions. No, we're actually going to do questions today, if that's okay. You don't normally do that in church, but we're going to do it, right? Yeah, so uh, Pastor Gary said we're going to do questions. He said we're going to do Q&A. That's actually not true. What we're going to do is we're going to do all Q, no A. <laughs> all right? So everyone will get to ask a question, and I'll go, hey, that's a good question. Next one? Hey, good. Hey, that's really good. All right, all right you guys ready to go? Let's start here in point two, does God exist? And whenever you talk about God, you've got to define what you mean by God because people have different conceptions of who God is. In fact, sometimes when people say they don't believe in God, I say, what kind of God don't you believe in? And then when they describe that God to me, I go, I don't believe in that kind of God either. Right? So what do we mean by a theistic God? A theistic God is a God who's beyond the universe, who created and sustains the universe, but he is not the universe. You know, a, a pantheistic God is the universe. A pantheistic God is me, you, the grass, the trees, the ground, everything's God. You know the pantheistic God. Use the force, Luke. That's the pantheist. We're not talking about that kind of God. We're talking about a God who is distinct from his creation as a painter is from a painting. Or a better analogy for God is God is to the universe what a band is to music, right? Jeff just had the worship team up here, and he was playing music with the worship team, right? He was creating and sustaining the music. But what happened as soon as the worship team stopped playing? What happened to the music? Music's over. That's what God is to creation. He doesn't just create it and leave it. God creates the universe he creates you, and he sustains the universe, and he sustains you. He is to you what a band is to music. So think of God in that sense. Now, what is the evidence that this being exists? There are three great arguments that we point out in both books. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist and stealing from God, which is not about tithing. Okay, good. And here they are. We're just going to go, just highlight them here, and we'll go through a little bit of detail on them. The first argument is the argument from the beginning of the universe, known as the cosmological argument. Cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. It says if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design, known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. It says that there's design in the universe and design in you, life. There must be a designer. Now, these two arguments have scientific evidence behind them. We'll look at a little bit of it here this morning. 
The third argument, however, has no scientific evidence behind it. It's more philosophical in nature, yet it's the argument we've all known since we were very small children, and it's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says that there's one thing morally wrong out there, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, or it's wrong to behead children like ISIS is doing right now. Then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then that's just your opinion against the baby torturer's opinion, or your opinion against Hitler's opinion, or your opinion against ISIS's opinion. If there's no standard outside of humanity, an authoritative moral standard, then there is nothing right or nothing wrong, but we all intuitively understand there is something really right and really wrong, therefore there must be a source for that. But let's start here at the first argument, the beginning argument, the cosmological argument, and this is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now some of you are going, uh, Frank, you know we're Christians in here, we're tabernacle of praise. Uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? That's correct. I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. <laughs> in fact, the, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good, you even have atheists admitting it. This atheist is one of the most prominent atheists in the world, Stephen Hawking. He's put it this way, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now Hawking tries to come up with another explanation for how the universe came into existence without God. I think he fails, but he's admitting the data. What's the data? That space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. Alexander Vilenkin, a cosmologist, and by the way, a cosmologist is not, not somebody who puts on your makeup. A cosmologist is somebody who studies the origin of the universe. He put it this way. He said, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. He's saying all the evidence points back to the fact that space, time, and matter had a beginning out of nothing. Now, he's an agnostic, which means he doesn't know whether God exists or not. But he's a believer in what's called the multiverse. Have you, have you heard of the multiverse? The idea that there are many universes out there and we just happen to be in the one that is designed, but it's not really designed because it's a designer, it just happened by chance kind of thing, you know? The problem for Vilenkin is he says, look, even if there are other universes out there, the whole show, all the universes together need an absolute beginning. So you don't get rid, you don't get rid of the need, it seems, for a beginning, even if there are other universes out there. Now, what is the evidence for this? It's all in the book. I don't have even time to go through it here this morning. It's not even controversial. Even the atheists are admitting this. And it's not just uh, these gentlemen who've said things about this. This is, uh, sir, uh, this is uh, Robert Jastrow, who worked for NASA for many years. He's an agnostic as well, or was. He died about seven years ago uh, at the age of, uh, I think he was in his mid-80s. And he worked for NASA for many years. He also worked where Hubble discovered, you heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, the guys who was, the telescope is named after, Edwin Hubble discovered the expanding universe. He actually worked in the Mount Wilson Observatory in Pasadena, California, where Hubble discovered the expanding universe. So he's not some Bible-thumping guy who says, well, I'm just going to believe this because the Bible says so. Yet he writes this book saying on page one, I'm an agnostic on religious matters. And then on page 14, he says this, the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The essential element in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis is the same. Then he went on in an interview to say this. By the way, this is an actual picture of Saturn from the Hubble Space Telescope. That's not a painting. That's Saturn in infrared. Anyway, here's what this agnostic astronomer Jastrow said in an interview. He said, astronomers now found they painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on the earth, and they have found that all this has happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover. That there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Now, wait, wait, why would an agnostic say it's scientifically proven that supernatural forces are at work? Why couldn't nature have created the universe? Why couldn't nature have created the universe? 
because nature's the effect, it can't be the cause. There was no nature. There was no space, time, or matter. There was nothing. What is nothing? Aristotle had a good definition of nothing. He said, nothing is what rocks dream about. That's nothing. No space, time, or matter. So it seems to me whatever caused space, time, and matter can't be made of space, time, and matter. In other words, it must be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Now you're starting to think about somebody like God, right? A spaceless, timeless, immaterial being. It wasn't just Jastrow who said this stuff, though. Every one of these guys have won Nobel Prizes in physics for discovering evidence that the universe had a beginning. Arno Penzias put it this way, the best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. His colleague, uh, Robert Wilson, said, certainly there was something that set it all off. I can't think of a better theory of the origin of the universe to match Genesis. George Smoot, who taught at UCAL berserkly, put it this way. He said, there is no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. So it's not even controversial that the universe had a beginning. So here's my question then. If the universe had a beginning, it seems to me it must have had a beginner. The evidence leads with one of the following two options. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? That no one created something out of nothing or that someone created something out of nothing? I was at Texas A&M a few years ago doing this presentation. I asked the question, an atheist said, oh, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, number one, let's take a look at number two first. Number two says, someone created something out of nothing. Now that's a miracle, right? But at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. In fact, I said to the audience at A&M that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all take the law of causality, which, by the way, by the way, by the way, the law of causality does not say everything has a cause. The law of causality says everything that comes to be has a cause. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. There has to be something that's uncaused. There has to be what Aristotle would call an unmoved mover, a being that just is that gets everything else created and in motion. You can't go on an infinite regress of causes. There has to be an uncaused first cause, what we, of course, would call God. So I said to the audience that night, I said, to show you how seriously we all, call, we all take the law of causality, that things don't pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause. There is nobody sitting in this room here tonight who is currently worried that as you sit here, a hippopotamus has appeared out of nothing by nothing in your dorm room and is currently defecating on your pillow. Right? You don't worry about that. You're not worried right here as you sit here that a raging Bengal tiger is just going to appear right here and start attacking people. You don't worry about that. Why? Because you know that things don't pop into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause. Well, why should we believe the whole universe pops into existence out of nothing by nothing without a cause? And if things did pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause, why doesn't everything do so? Why don't Mercedes Benzes pop into existence out of nothing, by nothing, without a cause? Why don't MacBook Pros do that? Could have saved me three grand if I had just waited long enough, right? If you go home this afternoon and want to have a pizza, does it make sense to order one? Or should you just sit there, wait, and hope? I mean, talk about faith, right? Who has more faith? Not the Christians. Christians are going, God created the universe. Atheists are going, no one created the universe. That takes a lot of faith. In fact, here's a question to ask an atheist. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? In other words, if there is no God, why does anything exist? If the atheist says, well, the universe has always existed, all the evidence shows it hasn't. And by the way, whatever created the universe must be timeless, right? Because time was created. Now, if you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No, you have no beginning. So when people say, who made God? You go, no one, because God didn't have a beginning. God is the unmade creator. God is outside of time. He's timeless, so he didn't have a beginning. He's what Aristotle would call the unmoved mover. So the question, who made God, is like asking a bachelor, what's your wife's name? 
Doesn't make any sense. He doesn't have a wife. God doesn't have a beginning. So when you ask who made God, the answer is nobody. All right, that's the first argument. There's a lot more in the book, but in the interest of time, we've got to move on to the second argument, the design argument. And this argument is done in at least two stages. The universe is designed, and so is life. Let's take a look at the universe first. The universe, it turns out, appears to be highly fine-tuned for life to exist here on Earth. In fact, for any universe to exist, it's highly fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors about the universe, the universe wouldn't be here, and neither would life. Stephen Hawking, again the atheist, put it this way. He said, the ex if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. So if you were to change the expansion rate, that infinitesimal amount from the very beginning, there would be no universe, which means we wouldn't be even sitting here to think about it, right? So the universe didn't explode into being out of nothing like a chaotic explosion. It exploded into being and somebody was guiding it from the very beginning and currently guides it right now. In fact, the expansion right, right now is, is, uh, is accelerating and it's fine-tuned. You know we're accelerating in our expansion rate right now? Nobody knows why. Some kind of dark energy, they think. But the universe is actually spreading out into nothing at an accelerated rate. And that expansion rate is fine-tuned as well. Somebody fine-tuned the universe. Now, what does this say about Darwinism? You always hear talk, people talk about macroevolution and all this. It says nothing about it except this. I, I often hear atheists saying, well, if macroevolution is true, there's no need for God. That's nonsense. Why? Because even if it was true, you still need a designer from the very beginning. You need a designer to create the universe and sustain the universe. Not only that, take a look at the uh, gravitational force. If it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40, we wouldn't be here. What's one part in 10 to the 40? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. Neither can I. Let me give you an illustration. Take a tape measure and stretch it from that wall all the way to that wall. Set the gravitational mark or the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure. I know gravity is not measured in inches, but this is just to give you a scale idea in your mind. If you were to move the strength of gravity one inch in either direction, we wouldn't be here. Except the scale doesn't go from that wall to that wall. The scale goes across the entire known universe, trillions of miles. And if the gravitational force were different on the scale of one inch either way, we wouldn't be here. I don't have enough faith to believe that that happened by chance, whatever that means, right? right. Somebody put that value right where it is. In fact, so is our solar system appears to be designed. Where are we in the solar system right here? Where are we? Right there, third rock, third rock from the sun, right? If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away from the sun, we wouldn't be here. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It is not too hot. It is not too cold. It is the axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours. Change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us. Change that slightly, we don't exist. Oxygen is 21% in the atmosphere. If it were 15%, we'd all suffocate. If it were 25%, spontaneous fires would break out. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we wouldn't exist. Why not? What does Jupiter do for us? Yes, Jupiter's uh, gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you see what these purple marks are right here? You know what they're caused by? They're caused by comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. <laughs> because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. In fact, I saw on the Drudge Report a couple of years ago, and by the way, whenever I want to be convinced the universe is going to end this week, I go to the Drudge Report. It's like, ah, that's happening? I didn't know that. Anyway, on the headline of the Drudge Report, it said, scientists think major meteor to hit Earth in 2040. 
I am rooting for Jupiter. <laughs> Maybe Jupiter will save us. In fact, you want to see the size of Jupiter? Check this out. Saturn is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. Okay, now check this out. You can hardly see Pluto. It's a dot right there. Now check this out. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto? Forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus. You got Arcturus here? Where's Arcturus now? Right here, left of the white star Regal. This is Antares, another star in our galaxy. This is not outside our galaxy. This is inside our galaxy. Uh, there's Arcturus. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto? Forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Beetlejuice here would be five or six Empire State buildings high. The heavens are awesome. Our distances between the stars are necessary for us to exist. 30 trillion miles between stars in our galaxy. All that's necessary for us to exist if there was different distances then gravitational forces would interrupt our orbits and we couldn't stay in orbit orbit now 30 trillion miles how far is that far take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius to go 30 trillion miles I was out in the desert museum in Tucson Arizona a number of years ago if you're ever going out to Tucson outside of the outside of the uh, city a little ways, there's a desert museum and they'll take you at night and on a clear night you can see thousands of stars in the sky. So we're out there one night and this guide goes, hey, if we look up at 903, we're going to see the space shuttle in orbit. That's how clear it is tonight. I was like, oh come on, we're not going to see the space shuttle in orbit. It's only 120 feet long. It's 350 miles up. We're not going to see it. At 903 the guide goes, look! And we look up in the sky, about 70 degrees above the horizon, there's an object streaking across the sky relative to us about like this. It's really cooking. When it got right about here, it disappeared. I don't know whether Scotty beamed it up or what. <laughs> but it was cruising across the sky. Actually, what happened was, despite the fact that we were in total darkness, the space shuttle was so high up, the sun was still reflecting off of it. When it got out of the range of the sun, we couldn't see it anymore. Now, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. Goes around the Earth once every hour and 15 minutes. Now, 18,000 miles an hour is five miles per second. You got trouble getting to work in the morning? Take the space shuttle. You'll Five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy an average distance away, 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles at five miles per second? Anyone? Centuries. I hear that. Yes. It would take 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy, an average distance, of the way, an average distance away, you'd be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. Who'd like to go to the next nearest star? We'll go. Get in, kids! 
Are we almost there yet, Dad? Another 200,000 years. Play some more Xbox. <laughs> Think about that. 200,000 years at five miles a second. The heavens are awesome. And how many stars are out there, by the way? An estimate. Number of stars out there, about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth. You see this over here on the left? This is from the ground. You see that little square right in the middle on the left? That's this square from the Hubble Space Telescope. Those are stars, heavenly bodies. February 1st, 2003, President Bush goes into the East Room of the White House. It's Saturday afternoon. They turn the TV camera on. Every major network carries his address. Saturday afternoon, why? President looks in the camera and says, my fellow Americans, this morning, our nation experienced a great tragedy. Upon re-entry into the atmosphere, the space shuttle Columbia burned up in the skies over Texas. There are no survivors. The Columbia is lost. The president then went on to quote from Isaiah chapter 40. Am I not working? It is? Is it working? Okay. I got power. All right. The president went on to quote then from Isaiah chapter 40. Why Isaiah chapter 40? Because in Isaiah chapter 40, God is speaking. And here's what God says. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. In other words, you want a comparison to know what I'm like? God says, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these stars and named them one by one? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The president looked back in the camera and said, the same God that created and named all those stars is the same God that created and knows the names of the seven astronauts who perished today. While they did not return safely home to us, we can all now pray they've all returned safely home. You want to know who God is like? Most Christians have the wrong idea of who God is like. We think God is like a big angel. God is not a big angel. You want to know what God is like? Think about the attributes of God. Spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent, all-knowing, sustaining creator. Think about those attributes. Then remove all limits from your mind. That's God. Why does the Bible say you shall make no graven image? Because any image you make of an infinite being necessarily limits his majesty. You can't draw a picture of an infinite God. Oh, you can draw a picture of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus has a human nature. But you can't draw a picture of the divine nature of God. He's infinite. He has no limits. That's why the Bible over and over again says, you want to know what I'm like? Look to the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 103, verse 11 says, God's love to those that fear him exceeds the height of the heavens above the earth. How high are the heavens above the earth? Stars equivalent to grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth. Over 200,000 years at five miles a second between those stars. Infinite from our perspective. That's the point. So you can look up in the skies and see a design and know there's a designer. You can also look into a microscope. After looking through a telescope, you can look through a microscope and see design in the simplest of life forms. You see this? This is a one-celled amoeba. Something like this, the Darwinists say we all evolve from. You heard of the theory of macroevolution? From the goo to you via the zoo? Okay, this is the goo. Or from the infantile to the reptile to the crocodile to the gentile. <laughs> they say we all came from this. Now, I, I have an important observation to make. As you look at this one-celled amoeba, do you notice that it doesn't say made by God or made by natural forces on it? 
In other words, you have to look at the evidence and make an interpretation. You have to look at that and try and interpret how it got here. Because science doesn't say anything scientists do. We talked about this last night. Science doesn't say a word. Scientists say things. And quite frequently, their philosophical presuppositions, which are atheistic in nature, determine how they interpret the data. So you have to look at this and say, was this put together by natural forces? Which, by the way, would also require some lawgiver, natural laws. But let's leave that aside. Or did this come together by some intelligent intervention? Well, in order to show you I think it was intelligent intervention, I've got to take you to your breakfast table. How many people in here like alphabet cereal? Anyone like alphabet cereal? Let's suppose you want to have a bowl of alphabet cereal one morning. You're a teenager. You come downstairs to have a bowl of alphabet cereal, and you see the box of alphabet cereals knocked over on the table, and right in the middle of the table, the letters spell, take out the garbage, mom. <laughs> what are you going to assume? The cat knocked the box over? Earthquake shook the house? No, you're going to say that that's intelligent design from an intelligent being. Mom. Or let's say you walk along the beach and you see in the sand, John loves Mary. What do you assume? The waves did that? Crabs came out of the water and made that message? No, you're going to say that had to be the product of intelligence because you know in all your prior experience that messages always come from minds. If you saw a rock formation outside of town that said on a little hill, welcome to Bedford. You wouldn't think that that just happened by the wind and the rain, right? Somebody intelligently made that message. Well, it turns out that this message is very similar. In fact, mathematically, it's identical to this message, DNA, the four-letter genetic alphabet every living thing has. You have DNA, I have DNA, a banana has DNA. And this is a message like take out the garbage mom. It's just a lot longer. In fact, the longest word we've ever discovered is inside every one of your 40 trillion cells. Your genome, it's called, has this code in it, and it's 3.5 billion letters long. All the letters are in the right order. And there's no known biological, chemical, or physical reason why the letters are in the order they're in, because everyone in here, unless you're on an identical twin, has a different order. Why are they like that? Bill Gates, who, as you know, is no Christian, although I hear he has started to go to church now, you know, the founder of Microsoft, said DNA is like a computer program, but it's far more complicated than anything we've ever created. Now, I don't know about you, but where I come from, if there's a program, there must be a programmer. If there's a code, there must be a coder. If there's a message, there must be a messenger. Now the question is, how much of a message is in a simple being like an amoeba? Before I tell you, you know how many amoebas you can line up in an inch? Several hundred. And in every one of these amoebas, there's a message that's thousand, a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia long. Some of you young people are going, what's an encyclopedia? People used to come to your door and go, hey, you want to buy the New World Encyclopedia or the Encyclopedia Britannica? It was like 26 volumes. Remember that? Think of a thousand of those. In an amoeba, a microscopic amoeba, there's that much information in something like that. All, all the letters are in the right order. Seems to me that the first life requires an intelligent cause. You say, Frank, well, who told you this? Some Christian? You know, no, no Christian told me this. You know who told me this? The, the greatest atheist in the world today, the most well-known Richard Dawkins, who's a biologist. He's the one that says there's this much information in there. He has no clue as to where it came from. Now, some people will say, well, this is a God of the gaps argument, Frank. What's a God of the gaps argument? You know what a God of the gaps argument is? You don't have a natural cause for it. You have a gap in your understanding, a gap in your knowledge. So you say, well, God must have done it. You plug God into that gap. And later on, you look stupid because you figure out it was a natural cause. Are we doing that here? No, why not? Because we don't just lack a natural explanation for a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia. A thousand volumes of an encyclopedia, we don't just lack a natural explanation. That's positive evidence for intelligence. When you see take out the garbage mom, spelled out in your alphabet serial, it's not just that you lack a natural explanation. You're not going, I just got to keep looking for more of a natural cause. You go, that's positive evidence for mom, right? Yeah. That's what we're doing here. 
Now, one more thing on biology. This is you in the beginning. This is you at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? Human. In fact, let's go back even earlier than this. Let's go back to when your mother and your father got together. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. When your mother and your father got together, first of all, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg. And then your father sent the entire population of the United States 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. In fact, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. <laughs> but you were. You beat out 300 million others. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the genetic information that makes you you. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book. And it contained the other half of the genetic information that makes you you. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You have not received any more genetic information from that point till right now. In fact, there is only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, well, Frank, you know, you can't legislate morality. No extra charge for this. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And I'm not saying legislate my morality or your morality. Let's legislate the morality. The one that Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The Bible even says it's self-evident. Paul says the Gentiles who do not have the law of the law written on their hearts. Everyone knows basic right and wrong. You don't even need the Bible to know basic right and wrong. Everyone already knows it. No extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From that point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of four thousand cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of a hundred thousand cells per second. For most of you anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others lung cells, others heart cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this day. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. Knock it off. How do you, are you thinking about this? You're going, wait, Frank, I got to make no, new red blood cells. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> You're not thinking about this. Why not? Well, this is not a conscious event in your mind, but it's happening. Why is it happening? Here's an argument for God we no longer use. We ought to use it more. It came from Aristotle, picked up by Aquinas in the 1200s. All of nature is goal-directed. You are goal-directed even though you're not thinking about it. The processes that are going on in your body right now are happening automatically. Why? Who's directing them? You're not directing them. There's some external intellect outside of you directing them. Why does an acorn always become an oak tree? Why doesn't it become a birch tree or an elm tree? Why doesn't it become a seahorse? Because it's goal-directed to become an oak tree. Because, it, look, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn sitting in the ground going, I got to become an oak tree, what do I do? No. Why does it always become an oak tree if properly nourished? Because there's an external intellect directing it toward an end. 
That external intellect is what we mean by God. He doesn't just create the universe and, and, and leave it. He creates the universe and sustains it. Do you know that they, develop, developmental biologists have done research on embryos, uh, fruit fly embryos? And they try and divert the fruit fly embryos early on in the developmental process. They try and get them to become something else. And what their fruit flies always do is they make heroic efforts to get back on track to become a fruit fly. Now, are fruit flies conscious in the embryonic stage? Are they going, wait, he's trying to divert me. i got to go back. No, they're not. Then how do they do that? Because there's an external intellect directing them. They're programmed. In fact, you know what they get from these experiments? They get four possible conclusions to these experiments. They get a normal fruit fly, they get a mutant fruit fly, or they get a dead fruit fly. They don't even get a horse fly, much less a horse. And yet, these atheists are saying, non-intelligent processes can do what we as intelligent beings can't do. We can't get a fruit fly to become something else, but somehow non-intelligent processes are going to do this? That doesn't make any sense. Now, all this is unpacked a lot more in the book, Stealing from God, which is not about tithing. Thank you, Susan. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to say one thing about this and go to your questions, okay? This moral argument, I normally make more of a case for this, but I just want to make one point, and then we're going to go to questions, if that's all right. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Buchenwald concentration camp in Wiedmar, Germany. Anyone here ever been to a concentration camp? Very sobering experience. In April of 1945, the Allies liberated the camp. They went through the front gate, which is still there. They looked off to the right. They saw the crematorium, which is still there. When they got down to the crematorium, they looked into the courtyard attached to the crematorium, and this is what they saw. Brace yourself for this. Now, if there is no God, this is just a matter of opinion. This is just your opinion against Hitler's opinion. Because if there's no standard beyond us, anything goes. Nothing's ultimately right. Nothing's ultimately wrong. In fact, who, how can you discover who's right and who's wrong? Mother Teresa, the Catholic nun who helped the poor her entire life, or Hitler, who murdered more than 6 million people in the Holocaust? Well, let me ask the question this way. How do you know which map of Scotland is better? Is it map A or map B? What would you need to see in order to know which map was better? What would you, what would you need to see? Yeah, you need to see a real unchanging place called Scotland. If Scotland doesn't exist, then these two maps are meaningless. But if Scotland does exist, we can see map A is a better representation of the real Scotland than is map B. Why? Because there's an external referent to measure these two maps by. That's exactly what we do when we compare Mother Teresa and Hitler. Mother Teresa wasn't the standard. Hitler wasn't the standard. There's a standard beyond both of them by which we measure both of them. And we say Mother Teresa measured up to the standard better than did Hitler. In fact, who is the standard? God's nature is the standard. God doesn't look to a standard beyond him. God doesn't invent the standard. God is the standard. God's understanding and God's, in fact, everything about God. He is the standard of everything by which we measure everything. All right, stand by for vectors, Victor. We're going to jump right ahead here to a sec, to another screen. Is that okay? Yep. Dun, 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 dun. I think we are. I want to sum this up, and we'll cover more of this this afternoon if you want to go into it more. But I want to point out from these three arguments that we've just talked about, we can draw some conclusions about God. From the cosmological argument, we can see that this being is immaterial, timeless, and spaceless. Why? Because he created material time and space, so he can't be made of material time and space, right? He must be immaterial, timeless, and spaceless. We can see that this being is also extremely powerful because he created out of nothing. No space, no matter, no time. He creates the universe. From the design argument, we can see he's extremely intelligent. We can also see that he sustains creation and he has purpose. We can also see from the moral argument that he's absolutely morally perfect. And we can also see that he's personal. How do we know he's personal, by the way, from the moral argument? 
Because you only have a moral obligation to persons, you don't have a moral obligation to impersonal forces. If you go try and dunk a basketball, you're not sinning against the law of gravity. You only sin against persons. We also know this being is personal from the cosmological argument. How so? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice and only persons make choices. Impersonal forces don't make choices. Gravity doesn't say, look, if Turek drops that remote one more time, I'm not going to pull it to the ground, right? It just does the same thing over and over again. So you needed a person to create. Now notice, we haven't opened the Bible yet, yet we have an immaterial, timeless, spaceless, extremely powerful, extremely intelligent, sustaining creator who has purpose, who's absolutely morally perfect and personal. This is the God of biblical Christianity identified without reference to the Bible. Again, we haven't opened the Bible yet, yet we have a being who suspiciously looks a lot like the God of the Bible. Now, does this mean Christianity is necessarily true? No, why? Because there's other theisms out there. Maybe Judaism's true. Or maybe Islam. Actually, Islam can't be true. Why? It's a theistic religion, but it doesn't believe that God is the standard of good. It believes that God is arbitrary. Allah, whatever Allah does is good. Whatever Allah does is good. God, God, Allah isn't good. Whatever he does is good. And so he can't be, but I just put it up there because it is a theistic world religion. Now, if God really wanted to tell us which one of these is true, he could do something only he could do, and that would be a miracle. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight at 6 o'clock. I'll talk about miracles. Ken said he was going to do one. Okay? So you'll have to come back tonight at 6 to see Ken do a miracle. What? Oh, I'm doing the miracle. Oh, okay. All right. So, again, uh, don't forget, if you want to get this PowerPoint presentation, here's how you get it. Okay? And we're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, as I mentioned last night. And I pointed out, by the way, that we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've combined these three into one social media platform. We call it UtwitFace. Okay? <laughs> so you may want to get that. All right? Don't forget we're on radio and TV. And if, if you do nothing else, at least download this app. It's free. The free app, the cross-examined app, two words in the App Store. It not only has all of our... our um, our uh, radio programs, it's got a quick answer section. So you're having a conversation with somebody, they say something that's wrong about Christianity, but you're not quite sure how to answer it. Chances are the objection they've brought up is right there on the app. So you can just look at your phone and say, hey, what about this? Okay, so you don't have to memorize all this stuff. All right, with that said, we don't normally do this in church, but we're going to spend a few minutes doing it today. Does anyone have any questions on anything we've talked about or anything we haven't talked about? And if there's something I can't answer, Ken will. There's a gentleman right there. Yes, sir. How do you reckon geological time of billions of years versus physical time of thousands of years? An excellent question. Does science show an old universe? Let's just spend a few minutes on this, okay? Does science show? I was going to cover this at 2 o'clock, but we'll cover it right now, okay? First of all, any time that you make a case for how old the universe is, you're making assumptions you cannot prove. Let me, sh let me demonstrate. The light from the stars is commonly thought to show the universe is 13.8 billion years old. But has the speed of light changed? We don't know. Has the speed of light changed? If it's changed, then all the other laws of physics would change. So it's probably a good assumption it hasn't changed. If the speed of light hasn't changed, the universe at least appears to be 13.8 billion years old. But it's in its assumption you can't prove, right? Secondly, salt in the ocean is often used to try and date the Earth anyway. But the deposition rate is assumed to be unchanged, and the beginning amount of salt and minerals is assumed to be zero. That's an assumption. Can you prove it? No, you can't. Uh, also, radioactive dating has assumptions you can't prove. Those are dating things here on the Earth. All dating, is, dating techniques have assumptions you can't prove. However, some will say, well, does the Bible teach a young universe? Some will say yes, some will say no, and Christians differ on this. You're going to find Christians say, yes, it teaches a young universe. Others say, no, it doesn't. Well, let me ask you this question. What does the first verse of the Bible say? In the beginning, what? God did what? Created what? The heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? In the beginning. Does it say when? It just says in the beginning. You say, what about the days? Well, the days begin in verse 3. So it seems to me that 
the initial creation happened before day one, it doesn't necessarily say how old the universe is. It might be several thousand years, but it could just leave the question open. And you say, e well, well, suppose the days do have something to do with the age of the universe. Well, even if the days are pertinent to the age question, the word for day in Genesis 1 could mean longer periods of time. In fact, there are four possible usages of the word day in the first chapter and a half of Genesis. There's the 24 hours, obviously. There's also 12 hours. Why? Because he says he called the light day and the darkness night. That's 12 hours, right? There's also a, a third possibility. Like if I were to say to you that Peyton Manning was a good quarterback in his day, you wouldn't think that Peyton Manning was just good for 24 hours, right? You go, I, I got it. It's an era. And then there's a fourth possible usage we'll get to here in a minute. In fact, this Genesis 2-4, we know it doesn't mean 24 hours. It says the day the Lord God created. That word day there means the entire creation six days. So the, the entire creation era. Also, the third day seems to require longer than 24 hours because you have the growth of vegetation, including fruit-bearing plants. Even if you put miracle grow on that stuff, it doesn't grow that quickly. You say, maybe God sped it up. You're right, maybe he did. But what's that again? That's an assumption you can't prove. How about the sixth day seems to require longer than 24 hours? The naming of the animals. You know, Adam named all the animals that day, and he started late in the day. Seems to, I mean, even at that point, there were a lot of animals around. In fact, Brad Stein, who's a Christian comedian, kind of has a bit on this. He says, when Adam began naming the animals that day, he was very creative in the beginning. He'd see an animal come by, he'd go, hippopotamus. He'd see another come by, rhinoceros, by the end of the day. <sighs> Cow. Ox, you know, I mean, he's just run out of gas, <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, here's the, here's the fourth possible usage of the word, because I know it's going to sound funny, but words don't have meanings. Words have usages. They do have meanings in usages, but only in usages, right? Because if I say the word day, it could mean 24 hours, could mean 12 hours, could mean an era, or it could mean an unending period of time, a day that hasn't ended yet. We are still in the seventh day right now. Hebrews chapter 4 says the seventh day is going on right now because God is still at rest. Well, if the seventh day is longer, maybe the other days are. We simply don't know. Seems to me that there's no conflict between science and the Bible. There's only conflict between some interpretations of the scientific and biblical data. Remember, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Uh, the universe may be older, it may be young. Science and the Bible are not definitive. What is definitive is that God created, not necessarily when. Doesn't matter how far back you go, you need a creator, right? Whether it was 10,000 years ago or 10 billion years ago, you still need a creator. So why we'll argue over this internally, don't make this a test for orthodoxy. I can guarantee you this. When you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, did you think it was old or young? Right? That's not going to be the question. It's going to be, what did you do with Jesus? So you can argue over this all day, and people do. If you want a good book on it, John Lennox from Oxford University, the guy I mentioned earlier uh, or last night, wrote a book called Seven Days That Divide the World. If you want an interesting book on the topic, get that book. All right. There you go. Is that enough? Okay, good. Anybody else? Gentleman over there in the back. Yes, sir. In light of the fact that we have a different opinion on the age of creation, mm -hmm. how does that affect uh, the possibility of theistic evolution? I don't think it affects it at all because if God's involved in evolution, he could do it over thousands of years or billions of years. It's up to him, right, if he's involved. But I don't see any evidence for macroevolution. I think there's evidence against it. In fact, we'll talk about it at the 2 o'clock hour, hour. I think there's evidence against macroevolution. I think microevolution is certainly clear. Uh, adaptation within a type. I think change over time happens. You know, If that's how you define evolution, that's certainly uh, fine. But the molecules to man version without intelligence, I, don't see that. I see there's evidence against that. And if God's involved, how would you detect him being involved? Right? Well, God just helped evolution. Well, then there is a God, so what's the big deal? <laughs> so I don't think it matters either way. On it, Left to its own, nature randomizes itself. More time doesn't help evolution. You say, how so? Well, suppose you fly a plane over your house, 
at 1,000 feet, and you've got red, white, and blue confetti. And when you go over your house, you dump all the confetti out. What are the odds it's going gonna, it's gonna to form the American flag on your lawn? Not very good, right? You say, well, give it more time. Well, OK, let's take it up to 10,000 feet and do the same thing. What are the odds then? Even less, right? Because nature randomizes things. So I don't see how time helps evolution. Anybody else? Same gentleman over here. These two guys are going to go back and forth. Sonny and Cher. Who wants to be Cher? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, how do you answer Islam, people of the Islamic faith, where the Quran tells them that Jesus was only a prophet, he was not the son of God, and that his death on the cross was rigged. Okay, my question is, how did you come to that conclusion? What evidence do you have for that position, in other words? You don't have to refute what they say, they have to support what they say. When somebody says something, it's not your job to refute it, it's their job to support it. So my question is, why do you think that's true? Well, the Quran says so, why do you think the Quran is true? And then I would, if you wanted to have a debate about that back and forth, I would say the Quran is written over 600 years after the events. Why would you believe a document written 600 years after Jesus was on the earth when you've got eyewitness testimony from the very people who are with Jesus? I, I, don't, I don't see. It would be like somebody saying you'd get a better account of uh, what happened uh, to Luther you know, that's 500 years ago, by somebody writing today rather than somebody who was with Luther and several people who wrote about Luther. You know, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make any sense for me to say that it would be better to take somebody much later. So I would just, just ask for evidence. You don't have to refute it. Ask them what evidence do they have. You got another one? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it seems to me one of the hardest things that I face when I um, talk to young people is just this lack of the belief that they can come to truth. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw that you were pointing some of those things out at the beginning, but um, how do you, you know, how do you have that conversation? I would ask them, again, why do you think that's not the case? That you, or why do you think it's the case you can't come to truth? And do you think it's true that you know you can't learn anything about truth? See, it's a self-defeating proposition. You know, we can't know the truth. Well, how do you know the truth? You can't know the truth then. Where do you come up with that? Yeah. Right. That sort of, of uh, yeah. conclusion. So they're coming to the truth that you can't come to the truth. Yeah. Now, I would, I would agree with them that, yeah, we can't know everything absolutely or certainly all the time. Most of the, of the knowledge we have is you know beyond a reasonable doubt. Like when everyone gets in their car and leaves here today after we have pizza and ice cream, because Ken said we would. Um, and you start driving home and you're going up over a hill, you're not sure there's not another car on the wrong side of the road coming over that hill to collide with yours, right? But you think there's pretty good evidence that there isn't because people generally obey, stay on the right side of the road. Uh, you have no absolute certainty that you're going to get to where you're going when you leave here. But yet, you make these decisions all the time. In fact, life and death decisions. I just flew here from Charlotte yesterday. I didn't even know who the pilot was. I didn't know anybody who ever worked on that plane. I didn't know anybody on the plane. I didn't know I was going to get here, but pretty certain I was. I mean, we, we, we operate that way all the time. You go for an operation, you don't even know the doctor. Some guy's going to come in and cut you open and cut you up, and you just go, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right? So. While people may think they're skeptics, they're not really skeptics. They're just skeptical of things they don't want to be true. That's what they're skeptical of. Yes, yes ma'am. So as we said yesterday, the elephant in the room is not evidence for many people. It's morality and accountability. They don't want it. They just want to do their own thing. Yes, ma'am. How does the average person like myself, or probably a lot of people here, address the questions of an atheist. Um, I want to take you with me to talk to this guy, but how do I address his questions? His, how do I even begin to engage a dialogue with him? He's, I've talked to, to him a couple of times, and he's pretty much shut down. He, and I don't know if that, I don't 
I don't want to blame myself completely for that. I think he was already an atheist, but... Well, I think the first question you want to ask somebody, if, if, if you want to make sure you're not wasting your time, the first question you want to ask somebody is, um, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? You want to ask, I'm just looking for a slide here, hang on. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Why do you think you want to ask that question? Because, depending upon how that person's answers, it, it'll determine whether they really are open or not. Because I found that many people are not open at all. They're not interested really in the truth. They're just interested in somehow affirming what they already believe because they don't want there to be a God. They want to do their own thing. And so I would say, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And if he hesitates or says, no, the problem isn't here, the problem's here. He doesn't want it to be true. If he says, yeah, I would, of course. Well, then what you can do is you can, when he makes a statement, ask questions back. And there are three questions you ought to ask people whenever they make a statement. I used one of them a minute ago when you were asking the question about uh, the uh, Quran. The first question is, what do you mean by that? Uh, I don't believe in God. What do you mean by God? Because people like Richard Dawkins and other atheists out there will say, well, uh, I'm an atheist on, on Ra, on Baal, on... The flying spaghetti monster on Thor, right? All these so-called gods. And you're an atheist too on all those. I just go one god further, he'll say. I believe in one less god than you. You're an atheist on all, you don't believe all those other beings exist, right? I just go one being further than you. The response to that is, well, the god of the Bible is not like Thor or Ra or Baal. The god of the Bible is the spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent, sustaining creator that grounds all of creation. If the God of the Bible exists and Thor exists, God created Thor, <laughs> right? So what do you mean by God is the first question, or what do you mean by that? The second question is, how did you come to that conclusion? Oh, I think there can't be a good God because there's too much evil in the world. Let's just use that one. First question, what do you mean by evil? Right? What do you mean by evil? You know what people will do when you ask them that question? They'll start giving you examples of evil. Well, murder's evil, rape's evil. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't want examples. I want a definition. They won't be able to define it without referring to good. And once they refer to good, they're referring to God's nature. That's why I say they're stealing from God to argue against him. They're saying there is no God because there's too much evil in the world, but evil wouldn't exist unless good existed, and good wouldn't exist unless God existed. So they're presupposing God exists to say he doesn't exist. They're stealing from him to say he's not there. So what do you mean by evil? Or, and then how'd you come to that conclusion? The third question is, have you ever considered? Have you ever considered that evil is not an argument against God? Evil is actually a backhanded argument for God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. So just those three questions. What do you mean by that? How'd you come to that conclusion? And have you ever considered... And those questions are in the app. So if you download the app and you go to the, the quick answer section, you, cl you click on truth there, you'll, it'll say start here, ask these questions. What do you mean by that? How would you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered? By the way, uh, parents, you can use this with your kids. These questions are universal. You can use them. You it's not just Christianity. You can use this. Like your, your son calls you at 11 o'clock and says uh, one night and says, Dad, I'm not going to be home in time. Uh, at 1130, he told me to be home. I'm sorry. I'm not just not going to make it. First question, Dad, what do you mean by that? What do you mean you're not going to make it home? Second question, how'd you come to that conclusion? Third question, have you ever considered if you're not home by 1130, you're grounded for two weeks? Be right home, Dad! <laughs> right? Now, by the way, husbands, never use these words with your wife. Because if your wife calls you an idiot, don't say, what do you mean by that? Okay? Or, how did you come to that conclusion? Because she's going to have a list that goes back 30 years. Yeah, here's all that. Here's why you're an idiot. You remember when you did this and you did that? You know? <laughs> so never use them with your with, with your wife, gentlemen. Okay. So those are the questions. But let me let say a broader a broader answer to that question is this: You don't get good at anything by casual contact. If you want to be good at interacting with atheists, you have to study. Right? People want like, can you give me a pill for this? No. And there are some things that you're really good at that I know nothing about, right? And the reason you're good at it is because you have studied it. Because you, that's an area of interest for you. We all have different areas of interest, all different talents, right? So if you're interested, and we all ought to be interested in God, we ought to be, in, we ought to be studying. 
We ought, to be, we ought to be trying to go out there and get answers. We ought to be getting the books and reading the books and getting the apps and watching the videos and talking to people about it. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, ma'am. Frank, I was just thinking that don't you think we tend to do this to ourselves? I think sometimes we think we have to get the whole job done when we talk to people. And um, yeah. I think sometimes I, I'm a librarian and I work with teens and kids sometimes and I'll think, sometimes I'll think, well, I just made that one little point and I think that they may never have heard that in, at any other time maybe in their life and I can just kind of rejoice in that. Exactly. In fact, I think that's well said. It's not your job to bring everybody to the foot of the cross with every conversation. That rarely happens. You're just planting a seed. Paul says, some plant, others water, God gives the increase, right? You're just planting a seed. Before somebody's going to accept Christianity, quite frequently they have to begin to doubt their worldview. So you start giving them reasons to doubt what they believe before they're going to accept what you believe. Some of you in here are old enough to remember the vacuum salespeople. They come to your door, try and sell you a vacuum. Right? Well, imagine some vacuum salesperson comes to your door, tries to sell you his vacuum, and you go, you think that's good? Hang on. You go into your closet, you get out your vacuum, you go, look at this! And he goes, I want it, and he buys it from you. Right? <laughs> How often do you think that's going to happen? Not. you got to get him to start doubting his vacuum before he's ever interested in yours. So just planting seeds, I think that's what you need to do. Yeah, you don't have to bring everybody to G you, you can't do it anyway. Just have a modest goal of getting him to doubt, like ask him a question. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? I can almost guarantee you this. Most people outside of this room right here, if you go out there and you ask them to support what they believe, very few people can do it. You know what people believe? They've heard slogans. The Bible's been changed throughout the uh, centuries. That's a slogan, right? Evolution's a fact. That's a slogan. They hear all these slogans. There's too much evil in the world. There can't be a good God. Slogan, slogan, slogan. Never realizing that the slogans aren't true, and if they were true, some of them would be mutually contradictory. So people just take their worldview, build their worldview on slogans. They don't have evidence. You think you're unprepared. They're even less prepared. So just start asking them questions to give them evidence for what they believe what they believe. Tell them to read my book. Read Ken's book. There you go. There you go. And if you get... If you donate fifteen dollars, he'll give you one. If you donate fifteen hundred, he'll give you two. I will. That's what he said. Yeah. She wants the car. Yeah, she wants the car. Okay. <laughs> Behind door number one. <clears throat> Are we ready to have pizza and ice cream, or do we have more questions? You did say pizza and ice cream, didn't you, Ken? What are we having for? We having are. something for lunch, aren't we? The kids are. The kids are having pizza and ice cream. Yeah. That's the only way you get them here. That's yeah, what you said. That's, right. right? that's, that's, right. Right. that's it. All right, you're going to close this out? Pastor Gary is. Pastor Gary's going to close this out. All right, there you go. Did you know that? Let's give him a good hand. Didn't you appreciate that? Wonderful. Wonderful. Amen. Could we stand? We have two more sessions, one at 2 o'clock and the other at 6 o'clock, and I know you're going to be here. The Bible says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you have love one for another. So take time to turn around, shake about 25 hands, hug about 25 necks, be back at 2 o'clock. God bless you. Have a great day.